Good morning, Physics 20. I hope you guys are having a good day so far. Welcome to our lesson on standing waves and resonance air columns. Now, this, the practical aspect of this is musical instruments. So for those of you who play uh, the flute or if you play the trombone or the tuba, um, or when I was in uh, junior high, I played the French horn. Not well, mind you, but I, I, I kind of played it for grade eight and grade nine. So all of these concepts are all based on the concept of standing waves and resonance and air columns. So in order to help demonstrate our ideas today, I rated my recycling for one of those uh, glass bottles that contains pop. Um, so this one had uh, fever tree tonic water in it, very nice. If you think, if you believe somebody is going to have, um, or they use tonic water or quinine, it'll treat COVID, they're wrong. Quinine does not treat COVID. Don't go there. Okay. No evidence supporting that. So I just peeled the labels off. So that way, when it comes time, we'll be able to draw on the standing waves um, from one of the, the glass pot bottle. And um, because I have no musical ability, I had to fish for um, something that would resemble an open-ended tube. And I came up with um, a whistle I used to use for commands when I was coaching archery. So not a whistle. I have I don't have an example of a string instrument because I don't play any instruments at all. Couldn't come up with an example for that. So sorry, guys. Um, but this is the basis of the physics for musical instruments. Cool, eh? All right. So ladies and gentlemen, and please enjoy Soundwave. It's made up of vinyl discs. Yeah. Okay. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, we're first going to look through the idea of what a standing wave is and how it is you and how the, it uses the laws of superposition with that. Okay, so what we have here is when we've got two waves that have identical wavelengths. Okay, so identical wavelengths, that's the key. And amplitudes, that's also the key. And they're going to move through each other. So one going one way, one going the other, and they're gonna be constantly doing this, okay? We can get a really cool interference pattern, which we use the law of superposition to get. So when the waves are in phase, so that means you're gonna get constructive interference. And if the waves are out of phase, you have destructive interference. So if you are still confused with that concept, come arrange a Google Meet. Um, or go back and re-watch the previous video on interference and do some more interference questions because you do kind of need interference for this one, okay? So as our two waves are going to pass through each other in opposite directions, we're going to shift in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, okay? And, we're go and because it's going to produce a wave that's going to seem to be just oscillating between two fixed points rather than just moving through a medium, okay? The resultant is what we call a standing wave. I think it's kind of a silly name because the waves are moving, they're not actually standing still, but that's what they decided to call them. So that's what we're gonna call them. So the pattern that we use to look at a standing wave is based on the following. So once again, we're going to go with uh, blue wave and red wave, okay? So we have uh, two waves that are coming in opposite directions, okay? So wave A, I'm going to make my red wave, and the red wave is coming here, okay? Now blue wave is going to be moseying along this way, doing this thing. They are going to meet at point A, okay? Now when these two waves meet, now notice our red wave here as it's moving along, doing its thing, where it normally would be, would be there. I'm actually gonna put that as a dotted line of where it normally would be without another wave, okay? So normally it would be there. Blue wave coming along, doing his thing. Normally, if there was no other wave, blue wave would be there. Well, look here. We now have two waves that are out of phase. So that means with our purple wave, we are going to have destructive interference. So we are gonna have no wave there, okay? They're gonna cancel each other out at point A. 
Well, the waves at that, they've overlapped a little bit. Now they're going to shift over a little bit. They're going to continue moving. As wave A moves its way along, okay, kind of like that, and as wave B moves his way along, he's, look at this now, wave B and wave A are now overlapping each other. Now remember when two waves are in phase and they overlap, what type of interference? Constructive. So you get your purple wave is going to be added of these two. Okay. The waves are now going to continue moving along. Okay. So red wave is doing his thing as, as he moves. And as each wave shifts a little bit, well, red wave would supposed to be doing this as he moves. And as blue wave moves, he's going this way. Well, blue wave would be doing this. But however, as there's other waves, guess what happens, ladies and gentlemen? Destructive interference. So you get a point where there are no waves. Okay. And I'm going to scroll down a bit here so it'll be easier. Come on, computer. Scroll down. There you go. So this process continues on, ladies and gentlemen, and it simply just repeats itself as these waves go past over and over and over again. So our red wave is now here, and the red wave would normally be running along this line like that as he's doing his thing. Well, guess what? Blue wave, as blue wave is coming in, well, that's where he would want to be too. So in the end, it's going to get constructive interference and we're going to be adding these wavelengths. Okay, so the process continues as these two waves continue to move back and forth across each other. So in, we, in the end, we're going to wind up with a resultant looking like this. So I'm going to, um, we're going to have a wave that is going to look like one half like this, where we have constructive interference. And then the wave will oscillate back like this at its constructive interference, like that. Okay, so as notice when we go back up and look at these lines again. Okay, so look, we've got constructive interference up here, oops, right here, and where the two troughs are. When we go to the next one, the constructive interference is where the peaks are. So you guys see that opposition, opposition there as the waves move over a, a notch? So that's why it looks like this, okay? So this is what it would look like. And these peaks here are where you have constructive interference, and these troughs down there, these little gullies there, this is where you have destructive interference. Okay? All right? So that is why a standing wave is going to look like that. All righty -o? All righty -o. So let's go on uh, to talk a little bit about some of the important points in a standing wave. So in your, in your standing wave, we're going to have nodes and anti-nodes. Nodes are the point where there is minimum amplitude. So these red dots here are the nodes. Okay, Those are all nodes where the amplitude is the minimum. An anti-node, ladies and gentlemen, I'll do in blue, these are the points where the amplitude is at its maximum. Okay, so these are the antinodes, these blue dots where our amplitude is at the distance. Okay, so as you can see here, our antinodes are going to oscillate between the two positions. So the antinode will be here and then 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 here. Okay, so that's where our antinodes are going to be. All right. Now, what is particularly important as well is that um, the distance between the neighboring nodes or antinodes is half 
a wavelength of the individual waves. Okay, well, let's draw one wave in here. Let's go green. So remember how one wave is the complete cycling of a wave. Well, this here is one wavelength, okay? And as it's alternating like that, that is one complete cycle, okay? So as you guys can see, the distance from one node to another node, that's half of a wavelength, okay? That is half of a wavelength. All right. Now, if we're going to go from anti node to anti node, from here to here is one half of a wavelength. Well, what is the distance between a node and an anti node? If we're going to go from uh, this purple spot here to this guy here, what's the distance between a node and an anti node? A quarter wavelength. So the distance along there, that distance, is one quarter of lambda. So that is also really, really important. We are going to um, be coming back to this throughout the video. All right. So if I was you, I'd pause the video and draw and label those things in there in your notes. Cobains? Cobains. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, a couple of other important points here before we get on to our drawings. Nodes always occur at closed or fixed ends. Okay, so that is important. So if you have a string that's going to be attached to an anchor point, or if you have an air tube that has a barrier or a closed end. So we're going to go back to our pop bottle here. So with the glass pop bottle, you have um, a closed end at one bottom and an open end at the other. So you're going to have a node always here. Okay. All right. Anti-nodes should occur at open ends. Okay, especially if you're going to be hearing sound out of it. All right. So, for example, let's draw some standing waves. All right. So, we're going to draw standing waves producing an open ended tube and one that's closed. And then I'm going to scroll down here. There we go. So, this guy here, we're going to draw open end at one, so an anti node there like that. This is really hard to draw on this with this tablet here. So that is our anti node. That is your node. Now remember what's the distance between one node and the next anti node? A quarter of the wavelength. All right. So on an open air column, it's going to look kind of like that, okay? Because we have to go from an anti-node to an anti-node, all right? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, anything that's gonna be vibrating in a standing wave is going to have a natural or resonant frequency at which they're going to vibrate to create a standing wave with the nodes and anti-nodes in the correct locations. So remember with the video of mechanical resonance and forced frequency, we can achieve this when a forced frequency matches the resonant frequency, okay? So um, this, for example, we're going to come back to our pop bottle here. Um, I really wish we actually had the resonant tubes, but I still can't go back to the school. So I don't have resonant tubes. I have a pop bottle. So with this uh, lovely tonic water pop bottle, when you blow over the top, if you can get the right frequency, it will resonate. So if you blow over the top and you don't match the force frequency, doesn't match the actual frequency, it's not going to make any noise. Okay. However, if you get the correct frequency and the correct location, you will get the resonance. Okay. And if I was to add water to this pop bottle, I would change the length of the tube, which would then change the re frequency in which is going to resonate. So that I will show later. Okay. 
So ladies and gentlemen, resonance, so the sound that you hear there, is where you have the points of constructive interference are going to be the maximum, okay? So resonance is heard when you have maximum amplitude, so where you have an anti-node. So in order for you actually to hear something, you have to have an anti-node at the open end of the tube, okay? Now, because of that, the resonant frequency, when you're going to have an anti-node at the open end of the tube, is going to depend on the length of the air column, okay? So, which I can change by adding more or less water into the pop bottle. So this is a classic example. We would have absolutely been playing with these in class if we weren't shut down, which is irritating me. So what we have here is a very short tube, okay? And then we have a tuning fork. So if you tap the tuning fork, and if the tuning fork is of a frequency that matches the tube, you are going to then have your frequency able to oscillate there. This is where you would have resonance. You would hear the sound, okay? So we have the same tuning fork and you're gonna tap the tuning fork over top of the tube when you lengthen it. Well, by keeping the tuning fork the same, the frequency, the forced frequency is going to be consistent. This length of the tube is not going to be one of the resonant frequencies of or this frequency is not going to be a resonant frequency of this tube because look at this, an anti-node is there. You're not going to hear anything. That's where destructive interference occurs. You want constructive interference at the end of the tube for you to hear it. So if we lengthen the tube again, ladies and gentlemen, we then have another anti-node at the end of the tube, which means you can hear it again. You get resonance. Okay, and then here you lengthen the tube again, and now the forced frequency is going to result in having an, an destructive interference, a node, so no frequency. Okay, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, where you hear resonance is where you have an anti-node at the end of the tube, and no resonance is where you have a node at the end of the tube. Sounds good? Okay. Now, this guy is super important here. So the fundamental frequency is the lowest frequency that you can guarantee to get a standing wave, okay? So the longest possible wavelength in that you can have resonance, okay? Okay, so let's look at this here. So when we look at these three wavelengths here, this is the fundamental frequency, okay? Because look at this, the wavelengths are, this wavelength is longer than this one. This one is, this one's the longest wavelength. This one's getting shorter, this one's getting shorter. The frequency is getting higher as you go along. So the distance from here to here, that is a quarter of a wavelength. Well, there's a quarter, there's half and there's 0.75, so that's three quarters of a wavelength. Well, here we've got one, two, three, four, five. This is five quarters of a wavelength, okay? So what that technically means is that this would be your fifth harmonic, this would be your third harmonic, and this would be your first harmonic, okay? So terms that we're not gonna worry too much about. So this here is your fundamental frequency. Now, if we have a, a tube that is fixed at both ends, for example, we are going to then have nodes there. If we have a tube that, or a string that's gonna be fixed at both ends, then this is the fundamental frequency, okay? Well, what is this? distance between two nodes, that is going to be half of a wavelength. This is a full wavelength, okay? And then we have, uh, this one is one and a half, and then that one is two. So if it's fixed at both ends, you're only gonna be running in half of wavelengths, and if it's an open-ended, or closed-end column, excuse me, you're gonna be having half wavelengths quarter wavelengths, excuse me, total Monday today. 
All right. So I know this is a pretty tricky concept. Um, but All right. So guys, more tech issues, as always. It's how we roll. So what we're going to look at now is I'm just going to jump and expand the screen here. There we go. There's all of me. So I've got uh, the pop bottle and I have a Sharpie. So what we're going to do with this um, example here is I'm going to draw a couple of standing waves on the bottle with the Sharpie. So then uh, you can kind of see where some of the waves could possibly be. All right. So when you blow over the top of a pop bottle and get the resonant frequency, okay, so what is happening is the wave is going to have an anti-node at the top, okay? So there's your, your anti-node kind of drawn at the top of the bottle. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. There you go, okay? So with this uh, on the pop bottle, the wave, when you blow over it, the sound wave will be bouncing along the sides of the bottle until it hits the bottom. Now you have to have a node at the bottom. Then a wave is going to come back. And then, okay. So then you have your anti-node at the top, which is where you're getting your constructive interference. And then at every node, you're getting destructive interference. Okay. So when you have a, this is an, uh, an open ended tube, even though it's technically closed at this end, we've got an open end here and an open end here. So this is a very, very uh, short open ended tube. And when you blow on the whistle, um, you're going to have an anti node here and an anti node there, which is where you're going to get your resonance. So, Okay, so a much shorter tube. So in order to, you're going to need a much shorter wavelength, so a higher frequency in order to get uh, the resonance. Cool, hey? All right. So I'm going to quickly pause the video and then I'm going to go put some water in this so then we can compare um, what um, the, the necessary frequency, depending on the length of the tube with uh, the tonic water bottle, okay? So your... Yeah, yay pop bottles. All right, so compare this one, okay, to the next one. I'm just gonna quickly pause this. If I can actually get it to pause. Okay, now I can get it to pause. All right, I'll be back. All right, we're back. So as you guys can see, I've added some water into this pop bottle here. And now we're going to jump full screen again if i can actually get this thing to work there we go okay so now listen to the difference in the frequency so it's now significantly a higher pitch so the frequency is now higher so the frequency necessary for resonance is going to be higher so a small uh, so that means a smaller wavelength okay so that's where you're going to get the resonance of the difference in the length of the tube sounds good that's how, that is why a tuba is a lot deeper in its pitch so it has a much lower frequency than a flute and because the length of the tubing is a lot different in a tuba long tube lower frequency and in a flute shorter tube higher frequency and then when you're going to get a, a little piccolo you're going to have an even higher frequency in order for resonance cool hey yeah I think it's pretty cool all right so we're going to jump back down there goes you can see the notes now so what we have here ladies and gentlemen is we're going to look at how we can do some calculations with this using the theory that we have since looked at Okay, so a closed air column, so it's data sheet on top of the writing tablet there. Okay, uh, resonates with a fundamental frequency of 225 hertz. What is the length of this air column if the speed of sound is 341 meters per second? Okay, well, the speed of sound, 341 meters per second, uh, the fundamental frequency 
as 225 hertz. Now, let's draw this for a moment. Now, let's think when we are going to be talking about our fundamental frequency. So there's our resonant tube, so your, your pop bottle, if you would. And then you are going to have be a fundamental frequency. So remember what we just wrote down. The fun definition of the fundamental frequency is... What? It is the longest wavelength or the highest frequency, excuse me, the lowest frequency or the longest wavelength, beg pardon, in which this is going to resonate, okay? So that means a fundamental frequency has to look like this in a closed air column, okay? So we want the longest possible wavelength, okay? Okay. So remember the distance between a node and an anti-node is what amount of a wavelength? A quarter wavelength. So the distance from here, let's uh, switch colors, from here to here is a quarter of a wavelength. So the length of the tube must be equal to a quarter of that wavelength. Okay, so that is going to be a key. The length is going to equal a quarter of the wavelength. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, that is the important point. That's the tricky part of this question. All right, well, we need to first determine what our wavelength is. Well, we've got speed and frequency, so guess what we can do? V is equal to F lambda. So I want lambda so I can get my lambda is going to equal the speed divided by the frequency. You have the speed of your wave of 341 meters per second and we have a frequency of 225 hertz. So once you plunk that into your calculator, you are going to get a wavelength of 1.515 repeating meters. Okay, now based on what we had said earlier, the length of the tube must equal a quarter of the wavelength. The wavelength is, we just calculated this, so we're gonna multiply um, our quarter by the wavelength we just calculated. So therefore, the length of this tube is going to, with appropriate sig digs and units, 0 0.379 meters. All right, okay. So as always, the math itself isn't super tricky. It's the theory that's getting you there. So recognizing the significance of what the term fundamental frequency is going to mean in relation to the length of your tube and the distance between the or and the amount of a wavelength is going to be within your nodes and antinodes. All right. So those are the key pieces for this question. All right. So for this one, this would be your stringed instrument. So I'll say your guitar, your violin. And for this one, we have a 0.6 meter string vibrates. Now, the second we're going to see a string, like a stringed instrument, so a guitar, in order to get a standing wave, it has to be fixed at both ends for a standing wave. So that means, let's write that down, fixed at both ends. There we go. So, well, let's draw this. Uh, once I erase these random things, there we go. So there's the fixed ends, there's your guitar string. And once again, fundamental frequency of 125 Hertz. Now, if we have a fundamental frequency, that means it is going to be the longest possible wavelength. Okay, the largest wavelength or the lowest frequency that this is going to be able to vibrate at. So, and when, remember that when 
you are going to have something vibrating with fixed ends. You have a node on either side. So it has to look like that for the fundamental frequency. So we have a frequency of 125 hertz. Come on, eraser. There we go. Okay. What is the speed of the wave going through the string? Okay. Well, the length of the string is 0 0.6 meters. We're trying to find the speed. Well, in order to find the speed of a wave, we need to use V equals F lambda. Well, we have the frequency, we have the length of the string, but we need to use the length in order to get the wavelength. Okay. Now let's think here for but the distance between one node and another node is equal to what proportion of a wavelength? Half a wavelength. Okay. So the length of the string, okay, is equal to one half of a wavelength. Well, we need the wavelength. We're going to rearrange this. I'm going to multiply both sides by two in order to cancel out that half. So double the length of the string is going to give me one wavelength. Okay. So the wavelength is going to equal my two times 0 0.6 meters, which is going to give me a lambda of the lovely value of 1.2 meters. All right. Well, oh, you've been asked to calculate the speed. We have the frequency. So the speed is equal to our 125 and then times the wavelength, which is 1.2 meters. And once you plonk that into your calculator with appropriate sig digs, now we'll do sig digs after. So I'm gonna get 150 meters per second. So then you are going to have 1.5 times 10 to the two meters per second with sig digs. Okay, so once again, the math isn't the hard part here. The hard part is figuring out uh, the relationship between your nodes and how to get the length, uh, the, the relationship between the length and the wavelength. So that's the tough part. Okay, so number three. Okay, let's erase these random things that have traveled down with us to the next question. Okay. So if you made the column longer of an open-ended column, explain what would happen to the fundamental frequency. All right, well, we, we kind of did this with the um, pot, bottle, and water. The principle is going to be very similar. So let's think back to that example. What did we do? What did I do to the closed-ended tube? I filled it with water. So that by filling it with water, that meant I made the tube shorter. The frequency or the pitch became higher, okay, so larger as the wavelength became smaller. Well, what would happen if we did the opposite? We would, what if we made a tube larger? Okay, you would expect that the frequency would decrease as our wavelength got larger. Well, but let's draw this. Here is an open ended tube. And once again, keyword, fundamental frequency. That means it has to be the first point of resonance, okay? So on an open-ended tube, in order for resonance to occur, you have to have an anti-node at both ends, okay? All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at this open-ended tube. What is the distance between two Anti-nodes, half a wavelength. Okay, so the distance from here to here is half of a wavelength. Okay, well, I am going to make this tube longer. Okay, let's make it significantly longer. And please excuse the fact these lines are anything but straight. Well, the fundamental frequency, it still has to be there means you have to have only one oscillation involving an anti-node at both ends in this open-ended tube. Well, this distance now 
is half of a wavelength. So what have I done now to my wavelength? I have increased its length. So when you increase the length of the column, your wavelength is going to increase. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, if the speed of sound is going to be the same with V equals F lambda, well, if I am going to, let's bring frequency over here, uh, speed is over frequency is equal to lambda, well, lambda is inversely proportionate to the frequency. So if you are going to increase your wavelength, you're going to decrease your frequency. If you're going to decrease your frequency, you're going to increase your wavelength. Well, here I've increased my wavelength. Okay. Sounds good. So what have I done to my frequency? I've made it lower. Okay. So the pitch has gone down. It's become deeper. Sounds good. Okay. So for this one, your frequency is going to decrease. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, last question on air tubes. So for this one, a tuning fork with a frequency of this many hertz. Okay, so we got our frequency of 256 hertz is held above a tube filled with water. Okay, so that means it's a closed ended tube. The water level um, of the tube can be adjusted at ED there, which would change the length of the air column in the tube. Okay, very good. What is the distance between two adjacent points where the mechanical resonance is the greatest? Let me have the speed of sound. Okay. So once again, the trickiest part of this question is not going to be the math. The trickiest part of the question is going to be figuring out what the distance between two adjacent points where resonance is the greatest actually means. Okay, and how we need to bring that into our math. So let's draw ourselves a closed air column. All right, so there's the water level. Okay, so that's where our tube is closed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I did not say this is the fundamental frequency. I said this is a frequency. Okay, well, we want two points where mechanical resonance is the greatest. So let's do some drawing here. I'll switch to blue for our wavelength and maybe scroll down while I'm at it. There we go. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw a wavelength in here. So there's that, like that. Okay, so we don't know exactly how uh, long this tube is. We don't know how many harmonics there are, so how many nodes or anti-nodes. We don't know that. But let's look at where is resonance going to be the greatest? At the anti-nodes. So I can reword this entire piece here and say, what is the distance between antinodes? Okay, so I could absolutely write that. So, well, an antinode is here. Let's switch to green so it's easier to see. We have an antinode here and an antinode here. So the question is essentially asking, what is the distance between two antinodes? Well, what proportion of a wavelength is, the is between two antinodes? Half a wavelength. Okay, so remembering that from earlier. Okay, so therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we are trying to figure out what half a wavelength is. So the distance that we are trying to calculate here is equal to half a wavelength.
So let's calculate the wavelength of this wave. So V is equal to F lambda. Well, guess what? We got the frequency and we got the speed of sound. So the wavelength is equal to our speed over the frequency and lambda is equal to the 343 divided by the 256. And we are going to get the lambda, our wavelength of 1.3398 dot, 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 dot meters. Okay. Well, the distance between two antinodes is half of a wavelength. Okay. So therefore, we have one half and we're going to multiply that by our wavelength of 1.3398 dot, 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 dot. And that's going to give us with appropriate sig dicks 0 0.67 meters. Or if it tickles your fancy, you are more welcome to write 67 centimeters. Alrighty, oh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, definitely a bit of a tricky concept, kind of hard to wrap your head around. I know it's a bit of a pain at first, but once you get the hang of it, I promise it's not as bad as it looks initially. So ladies and gentlemen, we've got some practice problems there at the bottom uh, for you guys to try from your workbooks. And then we've got another practice problem there for you guys to work on as well. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed the lesson and have a good day. No fires, injuries, or explosions. Talk to you later. Bye.